Okay. No to chyba możemy zaczynać. With that, I think we can start. Hello everyone. At our next today's seminar of the research platform Disability Studies in Eastern Europe Reconfigurations, which is financed funded by the Jagiellonian University from the POP Heritage Program. Just briefly to announce that uh, this platform has been operating for a year or so and it will continue for some time and its aim is to network and gather up people who deal with disability studies in the various countries and research centers and different areas of knowledge, culture, sciences, and arts, etc. Obviously, we invite you to take part in our monthly seminars, which are announced in advance on Facebook. There is some information about the next event and I'm posting links to this in the chat box and we also invite you to co-create this platform. We have just announced an open call for further seminars, so should you be interested in uh, um, doing such a seminar, you are um, kindly asked to, to join us and uh, the seminars uh, usually uh, are like today's one, so um, the lecture and the workshops, uh, but we invite calls for people who have uh, workshops only or uh, lectures only as well. Uh, the call is open until the end of November. Let me add that the first part of this conversation, today's seminar, is recorded and will be published on our website. So if you don't want your image to be spread, please turn off your camera. And now let me announce the agenda for today, because obviously all of us are waiting for the presentations, and there are two of them, and these are entitled Coordinating Accessibility in Cultural Institutions, and these will present state-of-the-art research on accessibility in cultural institutions. First, we will have Barbara Pasterak and Jakub Strudziński's presentation and followed by Rafał Lise's presentation. Following these presentations, there will be time for discussion and I invite you to jot down your remarks, questions, insights that you would like to share with us in the time of discussion then, around uh, 20 past 4, we'll take a 10-minute break, and then at half past 4, we'll have workshops uh, led by, by Agnieszka Wojciechowska Stay. She's with us. A warm welcome to Agnieszka. And uh, the workshops will be about easy to read text and how to convert text into ETR and it will be in the context of academic literature. This is what is awaiting us, and now we will introduce our uh, guests. First, we will present the duo of Barbara Pasterak and Jakub Studzinski, whose presentations will commence today's meeting. Barbara Pasterak is a theater pedagogue and educator. She's a leader of accessibility and she's a coordinator and implementing accessibility in contemporary arts for people uh, with uh, different needs. And Jakub Sudzinski is a historian, uh, it's a deaf educator and coordinator for the Mała Polska Kultura Wrażliwa uh, program uh, and he is uh, the accessibility coordinator of the uh, Lesser Poland Institute of Culture. He's a guide and also interpreter for the Polish Sign Language. Hello and warm welcome to all of you. The next panelist is Rafał Lis, who is an art historian, trainer and activist for accessible culture and arts. 
He's one of the first accessibility coordinators in Poland. He's been implementing these processes across cultural institutions and business institutions. He is an author of audio descriptions and he is a passionate of live audio descriptions. He's cooperating with many cultural institutions, including the local uh, Wengling um, House of Culture and the uh, um, facilities in Lublin. And I would like to refer you to his biographical note at, on our webpage on Facebook or Facebook profile. But now, without further ado, I would like to invite you to take the floor, Barbara and Jakub, the floor is yours. And now I'm turning on my presentation. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for inviting me to participate in this seminar. This is a fascinating experience for me and a marvelous opportunity to share with you the results of our research and the publication that we have co-authored with Basia Pasterak about uh, inclusive culture. This publication is mainly devoted to how cultural institutions can become more open, even more open. And when we were wondering what to write in this publication with Basia last year, and what areas should be researched, a question, uh, an idea arose to um, tackle the idea of inclusiveness in culture and inclusiveness in cultural institutions. And that is because inclusiveness is one of the mainstream developments in the society, apart from corporate responsibility, uh, mental well-being, and other aspects of this sort. That is why we took up this issue and this challenge and we decided to study inclusivity in cultural institutions and to check whether there is a relation or correlation, if you will, between inclusivity and accessibility and whether we are able to distinguish between these two concepts or are these two interrelated and are we um, perhaps we would, we would like to also investigate what is inclusivity, because um, inclusivity is a foreign word, is, uh, is a foreign origin, and that is why most people that we've talked to during this project had initially uh, have to think what inclusivity is. And uh, that is why we described what is the definition of inclusivity in this publication and we searched for places and connections between uh, uh, inclusivity and accessibility. This publication is also the, an opportunity to explain to the staff members in cultural institutions, and especially those who are at the beginning of their career pathways in cultural institutions, how to build inclusivity and accessibility in cultural institutions. And we believe that this publication may offer support for people who are coordinating accessibility and also people who de are deeply invested in this subject. In this publication, we also decided, or rather, this publication would not be possible if we didn't give the platform to people who are in charge of accessibility, uh, creating accessibility. That is why we took on board their well-being at work, mental well-being, because it's, it's of crucial importance for us. And that is why we included these aspects in the publication. Here is, you have, here is a summary of our research methods. We have divided it into three groups. First, we talked to leaders of accessibility in 10 leading cultural institutions in terms of accessibility and inclusivity. And we spoke to different leaders uh, uh, and we framed it in terms of in-depth interview. About an hour or 90 minutes of interview, we prepared guides for the interview. But also during the in-depth interview, 
we also probed for aspects that are interesting to us and to them as accessibility officers or coordinators, people who build accessibility from bottom up in cultural institutions. There are also surveys filled by 35 people. The survey contained 18 questions, out of which 13 were open-ended questions. And it has to be noted that 35 people have filled in these, this survey, which may seem to be a small number, but these are people who have genuine need to express their ideas about accessibility and want to be heard by the community. And there are very interesting conclusions that we will be tackling in a second. The third group are the people who are connected to culture whether as members of the audience, or artists, or simply people who are members of uh, the staff at cultural institutions uh, and do not um, benefit from educational and uh, cultural offer of offering of this institution. And these third um, um, sort of uh, frame of our conversation is also important. These third um, prong of our conversation have been anonymous. We've also asked about social media. We asked about inclusive institutions and what characterizes them. And many people responded to this question both in condition of anonymity and not. So the overall conclusions from this study were really interesting. And that is why I'm passing the floor now to Basia so that she explains a bit about it. We will be talking about surveys with people who are building accessibility in cultural institutions. These questionnaire surveys were completed online. It is not a large sample. Among thousands of people who are active in the field of accessibility, it's only 30 people who decided to complete uh, the questionnaire survey. We have some ideas why only few people decided to complete the survey. This is because these people are burdened with work and various responsibilities. That might be the reason why only few people decided to complete the survey. Let's turn to the following slide. This is the demographics. The people who we spoke to most of these people are active in the field of accessibility, have been active for two or three years now. So right from the start when the Act on Accessibility was in force. These are people who feel strongly about this particular issue and even before the Act came into force, that they had been feeling very strongly about this particular aspect of institutional life. Quite a lot of people who completed the survey only started working in this particular field, which means that there is a lot of staff turnover in this particular field, the field of accessibility. A lot of people who work in accessibility or for accessibility change jobs very often. Another slide. These are the institutions that we were dealing with. Most of the people that we were speaking to work at exhibition institutions, galleries, 
cultural institutions, community centers, or theaters. Let's turn to another slide. This is where these people live. Most of these people live in large cities, but several people from smaller towns joined a survey, or also people who live in rural areas. These are topics that we found particularly intriguing and that we focused much of our survey on. That is the nature of your job position. What is the nature of your job position? We spoke not only to people who coordinate accessibility, but also to people who build accessibility. Some of these people work as accessibility coordinators, but this is a small percentage. Most of these people act as accessibility coordinators, but their job positions are broader. They work with audiences, they work in education, they work in promotion. So these are the areas that they combine with the area of accessibility. The survey shows that people who work as go-to persons for audiences, first contact persons for audiences, they started to work in the area of accessibility before the Act on Accessibility came into force. This is because they realized that our audiences are extremely diverse and it is their duty to meet the needs of people with disabilities, of people with ASD, of individuals uh, who represent various minorities. Our survey shows that staff at cultural institutions are often misunderstood and they cannot rely on any people who would be willing to work with them, who would be able to cooperate with them, even if they act as managers. Sometimes they find it difficult to get people involved. They might be coordinators, they might be managers, and yet they find it difficult to organize the activities for accessibility, and they find it difficult to communicate with other departments, departments that are obliged to work with them pursuant to the Act on Accessibility. This is one of our final slides. I would like to focus on this particular slide because previous diagrams showed answers to closed questions. Most of the questions, however, that we asked were open-ended questions. We wanted to explore the needs of our respondents. We wanted to know what their beginnings as accessibility coordinators were. We wanted to know whether working for accessibility is part of the formal job descriptions. It often transpired that it wasn't. This was an additional duty. And in many job descriptions, there was not even a mention that working for accessibility is part of the professional duties. Some people didn't even know whether there is such a provision in the job description. They were working as accessibility coordinators because they were in on accessibility. Sometimes they worked as accessibility coordinators because they were given such a task by their supervisors. 
the top-down delegation of tasks naturally produces various kinds of feelings about the job that you perform. Kuba, in one of his slides, showed that one of the feelings that uh, uh, the people who worked as accessibility coordinators had was frustration. There is a lot of satisfaction in this work. This work is rewarding in many respects. Isabella Zawadzka wrote a paper about frustrated seekers of satisfaction. In her paper that was published in the Daskalia journal, she showed that uh, these two feelings, joy, euphoria, satisfaction and pride, are often intertwined with frustration. We feel satisfaction because we change the world, we make a difference to this world. A lot of people pointed out that they act as accessibility coordinators because they want to change the world, they want to make a difference, they can't imagine that their institution is not keen on accessibility. At the same time, they also said that they can rely on no support whatsoever from their supervisors. They often said that their supervisors don't see the need to develop this particular area and they don't see the need to provide suitable funding for the purpose. They often say such people do not come to our institution. That's what supervisors say. The supervisors also say we will find funding for deaf and hard of hearing audiences if such audiences come to our institutions. Jakub, would you like to add anything to what I've said? I would like to say that the main barrier in building accessibility is supervisors, managers, who often block the ideas and uh, they also block the enthusiasm of those who would like to build accessibility in their institutions. Even if supervisors support the staff in building accessibility, they are not very keen to coordinate everything in such a way that these ideas take tangible shape. As a result, the system does not seem to be working properly. In our publication, we write a lot about feelings because working in culture is all about emotions and feelings. If frustration prevails, if it gains the upper hand over joy and euphoria, this may lead to burnout. As a result, the tasks for accessibility may end up at the very bottom of the to-do list. In our publication, we are offering the following hypotheses. Whether an institution is accessible or inclusive depends on the well-being of staff at this institution. Those cultural institutions are not just buildings or ideas. Institutions are people who work there. We've written quite a lot based on interviews that we carried out with individuals that had the time and energy to speak to us. We've been writing quite a lot about the fact that those individuals who have 
regular contact with audiences who respond to their audience's needs. If there is a technical glitch, if there is a failure, technical failure and a particular device for people with disabilities does not work, those people who are keen on accessibility can find ways to seek solutions for individuals with disabilities. If people who are responsible for accessibility are overstrained, burdened with work, it's not very likely that they will find such solutions. Jakub, would you like to add something to this picture? Jakub has spent a lot of time carrying out this study. Yes, that was a very good summary of the whole study. Yes, we should emphasize the role of well-being among staff at cultural institutions. Without well-being, there won't be any accessibility and inclusiveness. This publication is available at the Małopolski Institute of Culture, Małopolski Cultural Institute. You can download this paper and read it in more detail. So that would be all from me. Uh, if there are any questions, we will be more than happy to take them. Thank you. So we are now turning to Rafał's presentation. There is one, there is one request. If you could post the links to the publication in the chat. Hello, I'm very pleased for being here and I'm oversensitized with all these screens and glittering things so give me a while to um, professionalize myself a bit. Thanks for having me and thanks to Barbara and Jakub for their research which has been inspiring for me and I'm really pleased that we are dealing with similar things at a similar time. At the same time, we are drawing conclusions that are a bit um, somewhat different. This is fascinating for me. I didn't provide you with bilingual presentation, but what you can see on the screen in English will be discussed in Polish. So I hope it won't produce any inconveniences, but apologies for that anyway. And I'm here explaining myself from this phrase of well-being. We've been inspired by this uh, concept and obviously in this publication and in this study we are not referring to any psychological or psychoeducational ideas. Uh, where they um, where they have conceptualization of this that is why we have this in brackets so we were not that much interested in psychological interpretation of this aspect and uh, this project is funded by the scholarship from the Ministry of Cultural and National Heritage but I'm not alone in this there are many uh, people who help me out, especially women, these are bottom-up processes, voluntary processes and also paid processes. And there are mm, towering figure, figures from uh, Impact Foundation, Agata Hetmanovic and Alexander Kotun, so that Lise is not omnipresent here in this research, uh, because uh, as you may have noticed in the bio note, I continue to be accessibility co coordinator and for me this is important and difficult subject because I want to share with my perspective, whereas in this context I shouldn't really be doing that. That is for everything as far as uh, introductory marks are concerned. This project entails three activities. 
The basis is laid by conversations with many people who, um, who laid the base for um, my research, took it, and to analyze the surveys and the quotes from these interviews, which have been anonymized, some of these were not anonymized as well, and also entire conversations have been placed in our um, publication. We have carried out more than 25 interviews and in fact this is an ongoing process so uh, you are all invited to take part in this project and I've been talking mainly to three groups, types of people, coordinators of accessibility at different cultural institutions where we tried to pick people from larger towns, smaller towns and people who have been recent into this job the, pe the woman who has been very fresh, uh, who started only in July dealing with this, but there are also accessibility officers, women who've been active in this profession for 12 or 13 years, who are the pioneers in this field. I am talking to self-advocates, people with disabilities. And I don't know if you can hear and see me. Yes, we can hear and see you perfectly. All right. We cannot see your image actually, but we can we can hear you. Okay, perhaps I could change the camera now. Maybe things are okay now. Yes. Okay. So, people with disabilities, self advocates, are uh, have been also involved in this project. And those people who are the so-called non-audiences are important for the Impact Foundation. These have knowledge about working with uh, cultural institutions and also people who represented NGOs were asked for the comments and feedback on the um, research project results. So um, this is at the same time the beginning and the end of this project, the inspiration and summing up of the project. We also had a survey, anonymized voluntary survey over online and we've received 109 responses and a huge thanks to all these who have decided to go for the survey. Uh, there have been more than 40 um, questions in this survey out of which 19 have been open-ended uh, questions so it took a lot of time for them to fill in the survey. and. Uh, Apologies to public sector and control institutions, but we wanted to have open-ended questions uh, because we didn't want to have an, the astroturfing responses. We wanted people to speak freely for themselves and thus to be able to capture certain phenomenon through these open-ended questions, which is not that possible through the closed-ended questions. My intuition is that we, as employees of the cultural and arts sector, w would love to um, gloss over certain imperfections we have. That's why these deliberate open question strategy. And my research question was, how do you do? your coordinators of accessibility. How do you cooperate with your teams? And this, is, this was the main motive around which uh, all the other questions have evolved. I will be talking more about these questions in a second, but just one small sentence from me. In fact, I haven't finished my job with this project. Uh, Hopefully, you will have the publication launch at the end of November and I'll be talking then about the research results and what could be the follow-up for this study in terms of accessibility coordination in Polish cultural institutions. And this publication will be available, unfortunately, only in Polish at this moment in time, but there will be comments from activists in Polish sign language and uh, um, a version in uh, easy to read text which will cover the most important aspects of uh, my research journey and will have insights not only from me but from uh, giants tower, gi towering over this field. 
So I hope that the publication will be useful for the accessibility coordinators, but also for the management cadres at the cultural institutions. Because I think some of the responses uh, are really food for thought for them, for the managing uh, staff at the cultural institutions. To, um, to go to the results of the research. I didn't uh, have the slide uh, on uh, demographics, but uh, it's quite similar to what Barbara and Jakub have explained. A curiosity. 88% of people who, ser who were surveyed were women. I think this suggests that uh, accessibility, coordination, and this sector in general is a feminized profession. A quarter of the respondents have been employees at uh, the, the museums and art institutions. Uh, most, most of them women, actually. And then, followed by libraries, uh, cultural institutions and centers, this is quite a surprise because I think the museums have been the first institutions to launch accessibility, so that's why they are represented. But the latter three categories are the institutions who have only later joined the bandwagon, especially libraries and uh, cultural centers. Uh, these have not really been included in grand narratives on uh, uh, making culture accessible. In terms of demographics, uh, this was a voluntary research survey. That is why I am looking at the response rate in terms of people who were the most motivated to participate in this. And especially in the context of this survey being a broad and time-consuming anonymous survey. So you should always take it into consideration. And also it is important to stress that six, more than 60% of people who filled in the survey are from the larger towns of more than 150,000 inhabitants. So perhaps accessibility is working a bit better in these larger centers than in smaller towns or municipalities. But we did have uh, some representation from uh, municipalities of less than 15,000 inhabitants or even 5,000 inhabitants. The slides you're seeing right now is quite important for us because we assumed that, based on our experience, there is a certain hectic atmosphere in cultural institutions and tasks and, and names of different positions uh, do not overlap they are a bit blurred uh, or they even contradict themselves. That is why we ask people to say if they have accessibility formally written into their job contract. And as you can see here, more than 60% of people participating in the survey have had defined accessibility, but this is ex not their exclusive task. And in most of the cases, the Percent, the share in percents of accessibility-related tasks is less than 30%. So, the perspective of a person who is uniquely dealing with accessibility as part of their job uh, is, um, is quite a unique one and quite a marginal one. The, the broadest perspective is that represented of the red color which didn't actually express themselves that much. And also there is a mishmash in terms of what is the name? Is there an accessibility officer there or coordinator? And judging by the results of our survey and conversations preceded, preceding this survey, if someone is called accessibility coordinator and perhaps they have it in their job contracts, then their well-being, in air quotes, in cultural institution, understood as agency, a sense of uh, comfort in the um, and ease at workplace, will be higher. So this has genuinely proved to be the case. 40% of people are really called accessibility coordinators and are backed by their job contracts. 
The latter group can be divided into half, those that are called accessibility coordinators, but they do not have backing in documents, and those do, who are not called accessibility coordinators, and therefore they do not have it written down in their job contracts. There is a small group of people who were, did not fit into any of these three preceding groups. So the results of these two questions tell us, suggest us, what is the professional perspective, organizational perspective of people who deal with accessibility? And once again, our hypothesis has been confirmed. The ones have it all, and they have they are enjoying better well-being than the other part of the people, the reds and the blues. And there is this 17 people who, whose sense of agency and emotions are taken care of. And uh, this is uh, really inspiring, but uh, it's a sorry state that only 17 people say uh, so. We feel that it's difficult to talk in Poland about uh, compensation. That is why we asked the following question. Are you receiving an additional salary for work towards accessibility? 5% said yes constantly. Um, 29 people, 27% yes, but uh, these are irregular payments, and 74 people, 68% said no. These uh, irregular compensations were usually part of uh, project compensations rather than regular monthly compensation. And this is uh, data about people who worked for accessibility over the last five years. And this is the final question. I've been speaking at length and then I will uh, pass on the mic to other people. The question, the last question, does your institution have access an accessibility department team? And as you can see, 84 respondents, 77% said no. Mm. However, there is a glimmer of hope because 23 percent of the respondents said that such teams are there in the workplaces uh, it is worth confronting the findings from the survey with other survey and other question whether uh, you work uh, with people from other institutions in the field of uh, accessibility Mm. Some people are a bit like Don Quixote's or Lara Crofts who work on their own without any help and cooperation with other institutions. Mm. A lot of people are such Lara Croft, such superheroes, which is sad news, in fact, because uh, coordination for me, means uh, arranging cooperation. Um, and there isn't that much cooperation, that much coordination in this field. I would like to leave you with this particular photograph. These um, findings, both extremely positive and extremely negative, these were seven people, 7%. So as you can see, these are marginal findings. This photograph shows that it's uh, just 10% uh, of the people who uh, produced these marginal uh, extreme outcomes, which is not that much. Every 10th person acts as a volunteer, they act on a voluntary basis, they are not uh, 
coordinators for accessibility based on their job descriptions or they do not work regularly. They usually work um, of their own accord. They usually coordinate accessibility because they feel very strongly about the subject. This is the perspective of those um, lonely wanderers above the sea of fog, uh, as uh, Kaspar David Friedrich's painting may suggest. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. If you wish to speak to me in greater detail about this study, don't hesitate to contact me. The report will probably be available at the end of November. Feel free to contact me at lease at artimpact.pl. Thank you. Thank you, Rafał. Thank you. We have now quite a lot of time for discussion for a conversation. We would like you to join us in this conversation. You may want to add comments and questions in the chat box. You may also want to take the floor, but we would like you to raise your hand so that we could moderate this discussion smoothly. Feel free to join us. Rafał? When Barbara was talking about the findings of the study, about the supervisors who produce unnecessary barriers, um, my study shows that supervisors are also the greatest barrier. The paradox is, however, that they may also be the ones who stimulate activities for accessibility. In other words, the answer to the following question, who helps you the most and who stops you the most, is supervisors. So again, these are supervisors, these are directors and managers. So as you can see, these supervisors are not the worst and not the best at the same time. Rafael, you said that your findings are slightly different from ours when you were able to diagnose this phenomenon. Perhaps our stories are similar, but proportions are different because I know that there are differences in the number of questions and the number of people who are in the sample. Perhaps I was a little bit too harsh. There were a lot of people who performed the tasks to build accessibility. We ask them the question about where they are in the structure. The median in our study was 2020. So the year 2020, this group 2020 are mainly people from other departments than education. So this is administration, this is some um, coordinators from other fields. This shows that accessibility, ta accessibility tasks are delegated to other departments. Some people delegate these tasks to technical staff, administrative task staff. This is mainly because of the size of the study and perhaps some people 
were not too determined to answer this question. I'm quite shocked that uh, these are not well-defined groups. So we have 40%. So we have people who are prepared and people who are not feeling prepared. There are no distinctive features of the cohort that is involved in the study. This is something mind-boggling in a sense, because the number of the people in the sample may not be representative of the entire group of people who work for accessibility in cultural institutions. As we speak to people who worked for accessibility before 2019, these are mainly educators with open hearts, whereas the perspective that I just presented is the perspective of the one third of the entire cohort that took part in the study. Speaking of administrative tasks, in our publication, we say that uh, the shifting stress on the coordination for accessibility is the, is the to shift the stress in such a way that it's everyone is responsible. It's like GDPR or fire hazard procedures. Coordinators are often seen as inspectors or administrative officers and not people who work with people on a daily basis. I saw one person who raised the hand in among our attendees. Is it Katarzyna? Hello. Isabella, thank you. A big thank you to our presenters. I join you. I joined you a little bit later than usual, and I am comparing my findings with uh, what you were saying. Naturally, the nature of working at university is slightly different than the nature of working at cultural centers both at universities and at cultural centers or institutions, thinking about accessibility is focused on the recipients. With universities, this is students at theaters or cultural centers, it's viewers or audiences, but this is not the only group that needs more accessibility. Staff at these institutions is also important, that is, people who work at these institutions and also perform on stage. I am wondering if this particular topic has surfaced in your studies. I will say a few words um, on behalf of Cuba, who did a lot on this subject last year. There was a paper on the employment of persons with disabilities at cultural institutions. In our publication, we spoke about it more in the context of in-depth interviews with artists with disabilities. We spoke to individuals who work at artistic institutions. This is an important context to us. We said in the publication that the representation of individuals with disabilities at various performative arts institutions translates into 
accessibility and inclusiveness in those institutions. This is a topic that we hold dear, that's for sure. Thank you. I will read the paper. Uh, I will read Justina's paper, the Center of Inclusive Art and their activities are focused on inclusiveness. This is a role model. Perhaps there are some things that they might be able to improve, but surely they have done a great deal to improve uh, uh, the area of inclusiveness. But what was the question exactly? I was wondering if uh, accessibility for staff at cultural institutions is covered in your study. No, I will put this intuition in my report. Have you heard about any cultural institution that would uh, be closed, that would be shut down? I haven't heard of any such institution. A lot of accessibility coordinators left the workplaces Last year, when I was writing a draft uh, for the project, I found out that 17 people left their jobs. Some of them went to some other institutions, but uh, in contrast to what Barbara and Jakub said, uh, I am not that keen on institutions because I know they will be able to continue their work. My focus is on those individuals, on those workers at cultural institutions. And this is what I kept asking them about, about the remuneration, about uh, the attitude of your supervisors to accessibility, the attitude of your supervisors to you. But again, my focus was individual, was on individuals, on the motivation and on whether they would like to continue their work at particular places. Yes, so I was thinking about accessibility for staff, not only for audiences. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, this has been something that has resonated because we didn't talk about these um, special needs among, I would say, the respondents. This wasn't part of demographics. So, uh, actually, it was very, very difficult, hard to anonymize people. I'm wondering how to describe these quotes uh, because I don't want these people to be isolated from the crowd. But in fact, there have been some perspectives shared in these negative contributions, so to say, on negative subjects, and to quote from memory, I became uh, accessibility coordinator because I am a heritage sign language, sign language uh, speaker, and uh, the head of the institution didn't find any other post for me. So, these things crop up when we speak about the relationship between the the supervisors and the employees. So it's something about that, right? And I would like to share something with you. This is a piece, a publication that we wrote about... So, one of the persons said, if you will publish, please write that accessibility coordinator is a tough job, this is not only roses and smileys from people who, who, are, who are disabled. These are not only inspiring conversations among accessibility coordinators, but also it's, it's about constantly reminding our 
heard our bosses and our colleagues about accessibility and people do not grasp this idea. It's also about asking for support with different results. It's a very hard job and tough job by doing it because this is a necessary job. Apologies for being honest and I hope that people will benefit from it and that people will uh, my voice will not be the only one because we don't need another publication that is talking about the need of accessibility for people with disabilities. That is why I decided to share this quote with you on the screen. Thank you very much. We also have a question uh, from the chat box from Wojciech Figiel who is interpreting today's meeting. That is why he is not able to take the floor, so I'll read it out. Dear all, thanks for your interesting presentations. I wanted to share a question, but uh, for obvious reasons I'm not able to do it uh, using my voice. Have you studied what are the relationships between accessibility coordinators and other people working for cultural institutions? I heard a sad story where not only the boss wasn't interested in accessibility, but also other rank-and-file workers uh, considered it to be unnecessary or tough job and the accessibility coordinator was actually ridiculed. Can you refer to this? And once again, thanks for your studies. Let me start. I think I tried to pinpoint this. Uh, but because of the pace of this conversation, I wasn't that to be able to do that. So many people spoke about the role of the supervisors, of the accessibility coordinator, the managers of cultural institutions, and I mentioned, as mentioned by Rafał, this may be a supportive person who sees the need for accessibility, but also a person who doesn't get the point of accessibility and dealing with it, but also these activities within the teams are varied. Our survey suggests that even in the institutions where there is a task force for accessibility, there is a sizable amount of frustration among accessibility coordination coordinators. They feel anger, they feel that they are not understood the way the cooperation should look like. And I think, as mentioned by Rafał, coordination is not always a, a rosy thing. So it's very hard to actually to coordinate if there is nothing to coordinate. So there is lack of understanding among other employees. In my survey, I did ask on multiple occasions about the relationship between in, within the team both about the emotions and about content-based cooperation to start from the end. One of the questions was as follows. Have you had any defeats re regarding accessibility? Can you describe one of these? And one of the aspects that has been pinpointed to, excluding architecture and digital or information communication accessibility, so the thing that it's unable to overcome ba these barriers were the contacts with the team and coordinating the team. 20% of people who participated in the survey spoke about these difficulties and challenges and this is something extraordinary in a negative sense of course. In another question we asked about feelings towards cooperating with the team how do you feel when cooperating with your team? In terms of good, we received 32 responses out of 83. Neutral, 10 responses. Bad, 19. So this perspective of saying, look, I'm fine, it's not more than 33% of the respondents is shared, but not, um, but not more than a third of the respondents. Just to add, as a counterweight, that we are talking a lot about challenges and difficulties, but we did have instances in our in-depth interviews where we have institutions where most of the team is involved, of the staff is involved and sees the needs. For example, the puppet theater in Wrocław. 
were the actors and people who are employed on different positions are included in accessibility and are joining up in accessibility efforts because they see the need for it and they come up with their own initiatives and they support each other. So there are also cases of these positive um, activities that are sort of spilled over into broader um, teams at the institution and the coordinator is not fighting for accessibility but rather co-creating it. That is why we wanted to show some of these examples and that is why we included larger excerpts from in-depth interviews and we highlighted them because they are so inspiring and they show us the bright sides and pathways for the future. My question is about your perspective. Uh, as I understand, all of you has been working as an accessibility coordinator. You are the leaders of accessibility. And that is um, what can be seen in your bio notes. I was wondering what was your reception of these studies. Uh, Rafał told us that he doesn't want to impose his own perspective in this uh, research, but I was wondering whether the results that have come to you and you are in a process of analyzing, whether these have surprised you or rather strengthened your own uh, preconceived ideas. Because you are so deeply embedded in the subject, we would it would be worthwhile to listen to your ideas. If I may start, I was thinking that this survey would not be that good as it was. So my feeling is that uh, my pessimism uh, and tendency to complain was not corroborated through these interviews. But my feeling is that I'm talking only to 10% of the people and they're our human being at the end of the day. Women, most of them. So these people are doing plenty of important things that contribute mm, in a decisive way to social inclusion and each and every time when I'm telling you that this is a small sample I am constantly thinking that even those two responses which differ from other re responses are important ones even though it's not a sizable group in terms of me in my research projects, well, I didn't have the tools, toolkit, to uh, carry out research. Uh, I'm not a statistician and I didn't have the toolbox to uh, deepen my own intuitions. The pathologies, the challenges, the problems uh, tackled with by accessibility coordinators are the same patholo patholog pathologies and problems that need to be tackled with the entire sector. It's not only us who have problems with our contracts, work overtime and feel not respected. This is a broader issue regarding the entire community of uh, cultural workers. And in all these inter-institutional teams and people who are in different, involved in different tasks, well, these are the people who suffer from the same problems. For example, PR people suffer from the same problem. And I was really crushed by the fact that accessibility, despite being inscribed into the law, enshrined into the law, is really neglected. We have bookkeeping in cultural institutions, but accessibility is not there. Let me share my own perspective. As Rafael mentioned, the people who uh, have quit accessibility coordinating jobs, well, I did so. I've changed my job over the past year. I previously have been accessibility coordinator. That was not my principal task. It was enshrined in my uh, contract, but uh, above all, I was uh, in, in the field of education and coordination of projects. 
But all these things that you have explained are actually um, felt by me personally. And I feel for this problem personally. I'm not a researcher, to be honest, and I didn't have any previous experience with carrying out studies together with Jakob. We were alone and I was so jealous when you, you and Rafa were talking about a whole set of people who were cooperating with you and that you strive for these studies to be objective and at the same time for you to be there. So I'm mm, perceiving it through the prism of individual stories and these are really salient for me. And uh, I think that the highlighted quotes are only part of these that we would love to highlight because some of them didn't find their way to the publication because these could not be anonymized. P people's identities would be able uh, to be uncovered, which is not something we wanted to do, as you said. And for me, it is important to stress the cultural institution perspective because these institutions are created by people who are employees at these institutions. And that is why we are talking both about cultural institutions and employees of these institutions. And it's a systemic problem. I do agree with you on that. We need to have actions that will counteract Bernard overburdening overproduction, over hours, etc. But for me, what is important when talking about accessibility is to acknowledge that when we talk about overburden of the production staff, administrative staff, uh, bookkeeping staff, well, my feeling is that if they don't issue another invoice, there are other consequences than the fallout from not taking care of human rights, which is the case of accessibility. People fulfill these functions on a voluntary basis, uh, oftentimes. And as I didn't mention that, but in our study, many people spoke about the economic dimension of accessibility, which is unnoticed, it's not rewarded financially, and people come to this field for ethical reasons and for the need to do that so that people with different needs have the right to access culture guaranteed. So the motivation here is paramount. To conclude your response, let me say Thank you. We have a few minutes, so if any of you has any questions, you are kindly asked and invited to share these. Hello, my name is Anya and I'm a freelancer. And for many years I've been into activities with artists with disabilities and, uh, if you will, diverse groups. Something that uh, is um, of my interest is that oftentimes the institutions are opening up on different, in different fields and are employing or accepting people with disabilities and involving them into activities of these constitu cultural institutions but, on the other hand, there is a lack of toolkit for cooperation and for preparing this fruitful cooperation. Thank you very much for your surveys. I think you did a great job and I'm crossing my fingers for further activities in this field. But my question would be, to what extent the implementation of fresh people who are dealing with inclusivity or accessibility coordination, to what extent do they enjoy content support on workshops? Because, um, in my opinion, this 
initial stage is the most difficult one. This field is broadening the field of accessibility, but do you know of any descriptions of situations where there was a nice introductory course uh, or prep meeting uh, for these freshly employed workers or giving them a ba database of contacts to support them because sometimes these people are left to their own devices so I'm wondering whether this was the subject of your research whether this support is actually delivered. All right. I will say a few words about my research. It is true that there was information about training, about attempts at uh, starting cooperation with NGOs, with people who do have ample experience in this field. People who work for accessibility, they also emphasize the role of networking. A big thank you for Jakub Studzinski for networks for accessibility coordinators and coordination. Jakub has just joined us after two days of uh, accessibility coordination training focused on providing support to people going through a mental crisis. The most important thing is that you all do not feel left to your own devices when you work for accessibility. There are also postgraduate studies in the field of coordination. Jaku has created a program of study at one such postgraduate program. Free access is also important. Free access to online recordings or various kinds of materials that one be able to use. Free culture and the Małopolska Cultural Institute is important. Bez barrier to Warsaw Academy of Accessibility. Institutional support is key. Because some times if you perform certain tasks during your working hours it's the responsibility of your institution to help you to perform these tasks. Rafał spoke about people who left various workplaces, various institutions and he spoke about the burnout. Institutions have very short memory. If an institution has certain procedures in place and if this person and if, if they don't have procedures in place and there is individual responsible for accessibility is leaving this workplace then everything starts from scratch we spoke to Isabella Zawadzka about this if an institution relies on individuals that means that an institution is not accessible. In other words, one should seek systemic solutions to this particular challenge. A few additional words. The knowledge base about accessibility and inclusion is focused on external effects and audiences. we speak about accessibility coordination through the lens of those external effects. If there's an interpreter, then the institution is accessible. These are the superficial conclusions. We 
Now know that it is more than that. Uh, we now know that those internal processes and their accessibility is being neglected. I provide training as well. During training, I say that you need to have documents which are accessible. Uh, there are people who act as auditors, and they are individuals with disabilities. Um, so this kind of activities for accessibility should also be performed. Coordination for accessibility attracts interest uh, when we talk about um, coordination in general. Now, it is easier for us to talk about uh, accessibility in general rather than internal processes that are taking place in particular institutions. Mm. There are various kinds of requirements. Some people talk about human rights. When they audit us, then there is a lot of tension among people in an institution. This leads to a lot of barriers that make it hard for accessibility to actually take place. A few years back, we were invited to the National Center of Cult Cultural Center. Uh, I carried out training and I received a lot of negative feedback because I was talking about those internal processes during training rather than accessibility for audiences, which my course participants expected. I'll ask I'll ask a few questions and comment and re read a few comments. Rafał Sobański, I am wondering what the role of coordinator in popular culture in television and uh, films is. The coordinator is often presented as some as a travesty, someone who hates their work. This kind of presentation of uh, coordinators perpetuates uh, various kinds of stereotypes which we already discussed. Is the representation of coordinators for accessibility changing so that uh, the reality of their jobs is presented in a fuller way? I'll try to answer this question. This question is a bit uh, surprising because I've never seen uh, a coordinator in a film or in a TV series that would be presented as a caricature. These are people who are extremely keen on accessibility. They work hard. I've never seen anyone in a film or in a TV series that would be acting as a coordinator and would be presented uh, as a travesty, as a caricature. As far as I can see, the gentleman who asked this question, uh, left the meeting and rejoined us. So the answer by Jakub Studzinski was that he has never met this kind of representation in popular culture. I am wondering if there are any other people who would like to answer this question. It seems to me that uh, no one outside the accessibility coordinator's environment speaks about this. That's the problem. That would be the shortest answer that I would be able to give. Thank you for being with us today, that you have attended this meeting in such a great number. Thank you for your presentations, for the presentation of your findings, for the discussion, links to the papers will be also presented in links under the recording of this meeting on YouTube. 
they have been provided in the chat box. A big thank you to our interpreters. Thank you. Wojciech Figiel and Bartosz Sowiński were interpreting this meeting for us. The workshop will start in a moment. Workshop in ERT writing. We will start in a moment in the same Zoom meeting. Please follow the same link. You do not need to turn off the meeting. You may stay with us or simply use the link again, the link that you were provided with. So thank you and see you in a few minutes time. Agnieszka, are you with us? Yes, I am. 